right. So I'm going to do a little review so we can myelinate your neurons, and when you go home, you can teach this, right? We started with the whole concept of Deuteronomy 6, when you lie down and when you rise, explaining that that's the most powerful time to teach anything, to do creativity, to do memory consolidation. And between your rapid eye movement, where you're reviewing the, the key things of the day, and especially the last things you talked about, and your slow wave movement, which is the deep, go deep into the memory banks, you are most aware of how to solve your problems, how to figure things out. After I did the work on sleep, I began to go to bed a half hour earlier every night just to lay in bed in the morning and say, okay, God, what, I, what do I need to do today? And it's marvelous. If you go to the National Sleep Institute website, you can read all about more, more about what sleep can do for uh, memory consolidation, for creativity. Um, Things like the benzene molecule, nobody could figure it out. And one guy put it in his head and woke up the next morning with the answer. Many of the Beatles songs came in dreams. Mary Shelley and Frankenstein and Dracula, lots of stuff comes in dreams if you just lie still and listen and say, speak, Lord, your servant, your servant is listening. So let, let those dreams in Job 30 do that for you. When you lie down and when you rise, Moses was a neurologist. Uh, at home and in temple, that literally changed, that changed the world. The best uh, book on uh, the early Christian church that I've read or ever read is an Augsburg Fortress book by Hans Tausing that said, that's called In the Beginning Was the Meal. Have any of you read In the Beginning Was the Meal? Oh, it'd be a marvelous, like, three-week adult study if you wanted to do it. And it talked about the power of the table and, and the koinonia that that we uh, Westerners today think is natural uh, was, not the koine, was not what the Greek and Greco-Roman world had. When Paul says there's no Jew or Greek, no male or female, nor slave nor free, that was a radical concept. The idea that we could all sit at the same table. And Tausing goes into the history of the Greco-Roman meals where it was always the rich people having banquets for each other but it wasn't Jew and Greek, it wasn't slave and free, it wasn't male and female. And that radical love at the table. You might want to decide to do your first cross-gen experiment pilot project incubator around a table, around meals. A beautiful place. It just feels different than in a, a Sunday school or a classroom at home and at temple. Luther, remember, he really had no interest in working with kids until he had a few. And then he had to figure out what to do. He was out in the hinterlands and was so surprised at the ignorance of the priests uh, that he went home, he grabbed those uh, old sermons he did, and he made it so simple. And he said, daily worship, daily prayer, daily scripture, childlike and prattle. I love that. What if that describes your faith formation three years from today, that it is every night in every home, and every week together in the body. We just barely got into the had there been no cheap gin in English and shoplifting, there'd be no Sunday schools today. If the, the gin epidemic was happening and the robbing was happening, so some wonderful Methodist women got to a newspaper publisher, this is in the red book on the table out there, uh, named Robert Rakes, and they said, we have to do something for the quote, the heathen hordes roaming the streets. And this was in the day of the great mission movements. They said, we're sending missionaries to China. We're sending uh, missionaries to South America. We're sending missionaries everywhere. Well, what about our own children on the street who've got no Christian parents to take care of them? And so the movement was born, and it wasn't born for Christians. If 200 years ago you said, I want your child in my Sunday school, a parent would have looked at you like, you think I'm incompetent? You think I'm not a Christian? I'm not having somebody else outsource my Christian education. It was clear the biblical injunction was to teach your children. And the archbishop called it Sabbath breaking. And all they really wanted to do was morality, literacy, and their Sunday school looked like that. They bribed children with ginger cookies to come into Sunday school. 
with pennies to come into Sunday school. This is all primary research. We, we read the actual articles and letters. We didn't read what people said about them to figure this out. And for some of the boys, they tied them to the benches with ropes and logs. <laughs> now, if I had to sit there for five hours being slightly ADDDDDD, you would have to tie me to benches with logs. I wouldn't sit through a Sunday school that looked like that. And yes, the church said, this is Sabbath breaking. This is a wicked use of holy time. We're going to fire you if you have a Sunday school in the Church of England. And finally, it took 100 years, and in some places it took 200 years, for it gradually to be accepted as okay. Okay, we'll do some faith education. And then something happened. And I happened to be, 1955, a product of that. This is the cover of Life Magazine, 1957, February, if you want to Google it and read the whole article. It's hard to read the top corner, but the top corner says the most wasted hour of the week and what we have to do to fix it. And already by 1957, some church leaders and, uh, were thinking, we are, we're taking the parents out of the picture. This will have no long-term good to anybody. We just can't, we can't do this. We can't replace it. So the mega churches start showing up and hiring youth workers and junior high and senior high and we'll have different things going on. The, the churches were bursting at the seams and they thought we have to build a Sunday school unit, a unit. And where did they get their unit? They got it from the school who got it from Henry Ford and the assembly line. The most efficient way of getting something done when you got too much stuff coming down the pike was Henry Ford's assembly line. And you put this on, add value, add value, add value, out the door. The school said, okay, first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, out the door. Everything will be fine. The church said, what are we going to do about the kids? They used, in many of the towns out here, they used the same architect who built the education unit at the school to build the education unit at the church. It's the same cinder block buildings, first, second, third. And in the mindset of the baby boomer parents then, we need somebody else to do this because I'm not qualified. I didn't have to have driver's ed. My parent, my dad taught me to drive. A couple, it shows probably. A couple years later, <laughs> you had to take it from a professional. And they got driver's ed and health ed and sex ed and Mr. Ed, every ed you can think of. <laughs> Get somebody else to do it. And the mega churches had enough money to hire a big staff. I had a curly haired Norwegian Afro, I did. I had the guitar on my back and the class B license. And that's what the church thought they wanted, find somebody to do that. And I was happy for 10 years to take the kids away from their parents until I had two suicides a month in a row of kids that I had from sixth grade to 12th grade. And standing at the same hill, hillside cemetery, looking into the faces of these parents whose hearts had been torn to pieces, I decided there has to be something different. I will not play this game for you anymore. I'm not going to take your children away from you. When they come home at 26 with a broken marriage and two kids and a dog, they're not coming to me. I know where they're going. They're going to the real youth worker, the person who would take a bullet for them without thinking twice. And I will not take that honor away from a parent. Yeah. Most mothers go up two dress sizes and turn prematurely gray for their kids. They are invested. <laughs> they are invested. Most dads, even on a day where your kid says, I hate you, I never want to speak to you again. Can I have 20 bucks on a ride to the mall? <laughs> even on that day, you jump in front of a bullet for that kid. You jump in front of a truck for that kid. That is love. M. Scott Peck in the classic book, The Road Less Traveled, said, love is not love until it does the work of love, which is to give when you don't feel like it. And most parents do that quite often. Sometimes it doesn't seem like much return. I know who the best youth workers are, the person who would jump in front of a truck without thinking twice. I know who the best youth workers are, the people who held them when they were crying and colicky, and put up with them when they were teenagers. I know who the best ones are, the ones who are there when you lie down and when you rise. And we just can't outsource this anymore to have a vital church. So I want you to think about something. What if we decided to reboot Sunday school? 
but we would do it by putting the cross in the middle of the generations. We do the adjacent possible, where that innovation and creativity comes from, by putting the cross of Jesus in the middle of the generations. I like the phrase cross-gen. Use it, steal it. It's only a sin to steal bad material. Cross-gen. <laughs> to me, intergenerational just doesn't, it doesn't say enough. No, I want the cross of Christ in the middle. I want the cross of Christ in the middle. Here's three different ways that we have uh, had churches do it. Uh, Chris can tell you about it. Chris is in the green book out in the hallway. We, we've, we've had... Um, purple. Purple, I'm sorry. We're liturgical, so... We had a dozen churches. We spent two, invested two years with, with them and then had them do a presentation in October out in Estes Park. Then we had another dozen churches. We had them do you know, case studies. And then uh, Chris and the pur purple book. The next book will be blue. We will stay liturgical. Write down first week of October 2020. The Lord might be calling you to the mountains of Colorado. Every other year, God calls me in the fall to Colorado. I don't know why it's a burden I must bear. But, <laughs> but all the churches who are trying this model, this is a 10-year incubator we're hosting and funding, are doing one of three models. Well, oh, that's a little messed up here. Uh, one is take worship, which is the old English word for the ship that brings worth to God, the vehicle that brings worth to God, and put in some education stuff. That's one way to do it. Tell the story with multiple senses. Connect the brain to the body, to the environment. Annie Patel, who's the author of the book Music, Language, and the Brain, tells, us, tells me that the mind is bigger than the brain. The mind is the brain meets the body meets the environment. And anytime you get the brain to meet the body to meet the environment, you have attention and retention and ownership. And then engage in cross-generational conversations. And it's as simple as this little liturgy. Share, read, talk, pray, bless. Share, read, talk, pray, bless. Do your highs and lows with someone who's at least 20 years younger or older than you. One-on-one. -on -one. If you try to do highs and lows with four generations at a table, uh, the, the introverts will shut up and the extroverts won't. <laughs> In a group of more than six, two people will do 80% of the talking. And the deepest thinking people you have, probably your introverts, won't say anything. So you're not creating an educational system that leads out and draws out. You know the word educate has the word duke in it? It literally means to lead out. The duke is the leader. Set up a system where everyone is led out. Everyone gets to be the teacher. A second way people are doing cross-gen is to take their education time but start sneaking communion in it. Start sneaking an offering in it. Start sneaking the Lord's Prayer and the other rituals and traditions that are valuable to you. Why wouldn't you do Holy Communion? Now, I was uh, young enough in seminary to remember a guy named Nestigan who was fighting when churches were saying we should only do communion once a month. And he'd say, what's the matter? You don't like forgiveness? <laughs> you know? Well, out in North Dakota, the preacher only got there once a month. So that's on you at communion, right? It's a little easier now. Why not bring communion in and turn your edu worship? Isn't that a weird word, edu worship? It's an adjacent possible. Google was a weird word, word 10 years ago too. Five years from now, people are going to be trying to figure out the adjacent possible of education and worship and the cross and the generation. Why wouldn't you do the Lord's Prayer and embed that and myelinate the neurons with the young people? You go to the nursing home and you can be talking, talking, talking and people aren't there and you start the ritual, you start the Lord's Prayer, you start the words of institution, you start the 23rd Psalm and they're back. Why? Because they were myelinated. They had all that insulation and those wires that fire more efficiently will be the last to go. Why wouldn't you bring those things that are so precious to you from your child into the regular over and over and over. If children don't grow up worshiping, they're not going to become adults who worship. The best way to raise an adult who doesn't worship is to raise a child who doesn't worship. It's not going to be natural to go into worship suddenly when you're in confirmation or something like that. It's just not going to be. They will not have myelinated the neurons. The passing of the peace. Once you know highs and lows... Passing of the peace is a whole different thing. And there are tears during the passing of the peace. 
And of course, the offering can be more than money. It can be the creativity that you do around a table. Throw Legos on this table. Throw costumes from the closet on this table. Throw whatever food is in the kitchen on this table. Tell them our, our, uh, our text today is rivers of living water. You got 20 minutes, go. And let them do the creating. You don't need a curriculum. And by the way, I sell curriculum. But you don't need a curriculum. The word curriculum and the word circle come from the chariot course in Rome that went around and around and around. Yeah. You have a living curriculum in your church. Walking on two feet or maybe two feet in a walker. You've got everything you need. You don't have to spend a nickel, but it's priceless when you let them create. Bill Glasser wrote a book about the quality school. The title was The Quality School. And he said, in a quality school, everyone's a teacher. In a quality church, is everyone the preacher? Yeah. If you've got eight people at a table, and if the average age is 50, you've got 400 years of experience at that table. How could I be the only teacher in a room with 400 years of experience and hurts and highs and lows and pain and loss and grief. They've got so much more to teach me than I have to teach them. And in a television era generation, yeah, you wanted a good show on the stage. But in the post-television era, you cannot be the show. In the post-television era, the show is over. I'm sorry, preacher. The show is over. You need to be the curator of a conversation not the conversation, or they'll be gone. Their bodies might be there, but they're not there. What if you become the curator of all of God's gifts and all of God's wisdom and all of God's stories, and you lead out and you set up a system where you're not the only sermon. You give them a little bit and get them going and throw the stuff on the table. Picasso said, art is the lie that helps us see the truth. Throw the stuff on the table. Throw all the stuff out of the closets. Grab junk from the junk drawer. Make the lesson and now you teach me. What if the new three-point sermon was, I'll give you a little, you figure it out, you present during talk time. And before we go into the rest of it, I've learned from everyone what a gift that would be. This structure could be your liturgy, because it's a liturgy that can myelinate on Sunday and go home Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And it doesn't cost a nickel to do highs and lows, but it's priceless. Psychologically, when you know somebody's joy and know their pain, remember what happens? 100 yards a second, 100 yards a second, pop, bam. You're drugging your people with dopamine every week, and they want to be more there. Psychologically, when you rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep, the tears in their eyes are washing out cortisol. You're washing off the stuff that'll eat them alive. When grandpa lost grandma after 52 years of marriage, his whole body was under attack by cortisol. His whole body. When he buried all five of his brothers and sisters in Sioux City, one after another after another, he lost a piece of his mind with every funeral. Annie Patel says the mind is the brain meets the body meets the environment. Every loss takes a piece of your brain, takes a piece of your body, and takes a piece of your environment. The church is the only place that can fill in those gaps. And a little child's pudgy little hand and prayers for highs and lows washes away the cortisol, builds up the dopamine, improves the immune system, improves the cardiovascular system. Getting rid of cortisol allows the melatonin can, to click in. Grandpa can get some good sleep knowing he's loved by more than just one. How can one parent ex be expected to parent a teenager or two or three in this world today? It wasn't done in the ancient world. Everybody took care of everybody. Everybody needed everybody. And you can do that in your church if you decide, we're not just going to have classes. We're going to build community. We're not just going to have lessons. We're going to build relationship. If you do this really well, you can be the church with no class. 
We are the church with no class. <laughs> no. If we only have an hour or two, it is too important. We will be the body of Christ cell by cell for each other. Share, read, talk, pray, bless. Here are some elements that we learned about uh, cross-gen, no class. We had funded an experiment for five years from 1997 to 2001, and it was called Total Family Sunday School, and it was a bomb. The first year, we had 75 churches doing it. The second year, we had 225 churches. The third year, we had 500 churches. The fourth year, we had 225 churches. The fifth year, we had 75 churches. Only two pastors got fired for trying this that I know of. <laughs> but just like the Lisa computer was a bomb and the Macintosh was born out of the stuff they pulled out of the motherboard, we put Total Family Sunday School away for a while. And then when that graph from the ELCA came out, we said, it's time. Back in the 90s, you could still get enough Sunday school teachers. Back in the 90s, they might even know the Bible, right? Today, they think Joan of Arc was Noah's wife. They got no clue. No clue. <laughs> Back in the 90s, regular worship was, I'm there every Sunday, I'm in town. Today, if somebody's there once a month, that's pretty regular worship. Yeah, right. And so we said, okay, if we're going to resurrect it, what did we learn from bombing? I mean, we, we spent five years and hundreds of thousands of dollars to bomb. What can we learn to pull out of the lease to build a Macintosh? And number one, we said, whatever we do, parents, children, and cross-generational adopted gift families. I like the word gift. Generations in faith together. Gift. People like a gift. Gift is both a noun and a verb, right? I love the... We're going to create a gift family. And we learned that if you just commit for 40 days, six weeks, month and a half, that's doable. Will you covenant to be in the body together and to be in prayer for each other's highs and lows every night in every home? The second thing we learned is upfront leadership is every age and every stage. Every age has gifts we need and every age has needs we gift when we decide that the preacher or the teacher is not the only teacher, the only preacher in the room. The third thing we learned was the adjacent possible of worship, education, fellowship, food and fun, and faith talk intentionally blended together, intentionally. The fourth thing, thing we learned had to do with music, movement, theater, and other creative arts where you let the people create the arts. You don't try to do a show for them. Show and tell, remember show and tell when you were in a little uh, kindergarten? It's brilliant neurology. Because you have to choose something you're interested in, and then you have to turn, how am I going to interpret it? And then they applaud and you get dopamine. It's just brilliant neurology. But if you create the, uh, create the creative environment and then pull in the worship elements, oh my goodness, you don't have to entertain. It is so hard to entertain today to the post-television generation. Do you know that a goldfish has a nine-second attention span and an American teenager has a seven-second <laughs> attention span? How can you teach in that world? I can't even teach in that world, and I'm a good teacher. You just can't do it. Don't even try. Don't fight that battle. It is so hard to, shut up, sit down. We're talking about God's love. <laughs> I don't want to do that. Don't do it to your teachers. Jesus already paid for your sins. You should not have to. Come on. Don't do that to anybody. The show's over. Don't try to do a show for a post-television generation or they'll be gone. Right? Don't even try. They're the show. And if they're not there, they're missed because they were an important part of it. And then bring in those elements. Share, read, talk, pray, bless. Model it when you're in the body. And covenant every night in every home. And if we don't have five minutes for each other at the end of the day, what do we have two hours for video games, two hours for internet, two hours for this, two hours for that? The best way to do this with your experiment, if you have every age and stage, is to ask parents, are you having a little problem with this at home? Okay. Here's the deal. Um, every parent must tell their child, Remember the golden rule. He or she who has the gold makes the rule. 
I, an adult with a fully developed prefrontal cortex, have determined that it might be good for you to have one of these, but you don't have any money really for this. You know how much this costs to buy and keep it every month? And so technically, this is not your phone. This is my phone that I, out of the benevolence of my heart, have chosen to allow you to have for maybe up to 10, 12 hours a day. But when I say, hey, five minutes, faith five, highs and lows, this will come back to me and I will put it in a basket. I will put it in the refrigerator. I will put it anywhere I want because it's my phone that I bought with my money. And if you don't have five minutes for mama at the end of the day, for daddy, I don't have five cents for your cell phone. Why would I, an adult, with a fully developed judgment center prefrontal cortex, provide a communication device for a child who doesn't communicate with me? <laughs> Not gonna do it. By the way, we're taping this. You can take that little two-minute segment, play it to all your parents, right? <laughs> The same thing with the car keys when they turn 16. Do you know how much, how expensive it is to insure a teenage driver, especially a, a teenage boy driver? No, I do not have five cents for your car insurance if you don't have five minutes for me at the end of the day. Just not going to do it. Not going to do it. Remember the golden rule. We're going to do it together in the body, and then we're going to covenant for every night in every home. The sixth element we figured out was, yeah, this covenant we're going to pray. This will be part of our gift family, our faith family, whatever you want to call it. The seventh thing we learned is we become the core for all gatherings at churches. Where, and the age-specific retreats, classes, and everything, that becomes the exception and the supplement, not the norm. If you want to incubate a vital church in the future, take care of the cells. It's fine to have a fifth grade retreat. Yeah, you bet. It's fine to have this and that. Fine. But move toward, after you've built your, your small group and let it grow, move toward the place where those age-separated things, they can get that everywhere in school and community, where those are the exception and the supplement. It's not the norm in an incubation church. Systems thinking. If you want to commit to a long-term solution to change one system to another, it's really helpful to be reading systems theory. The best... Uh, the best book I've read on this is a book called The Fifth Discipline by Peter Senge at MIT. I can send you the bibliography if you want. But Senge says you have to get, your first discipline is you have to get your own vision straight. Committees don't have vision, people do. The second vis, uh, discipline is you have to build a team, a vision team, and build it out of every generation if you want to do cross-gen. Yeah. Third discipline is you have to take a systems approach to a systems problem. We're not going to fix the... the uh, the problem at church by buying a new curriculum. We need to look at all the pieces all the time. You have to build a learning organization. And so we're always asking, what's working, what's not working, how do we make it better, go. What's working, what's not working, how do you make it better, go. And so your leadership team huddles up and asks those three simple questions every time. Yeah, again and again. Police, media, and schools. General Electric was once the most uh, powerful and uh, healthy company in America. And during the 80s, Jack Welch was the CEO of this healthy company, started by Thomas Elva Edison. Right now, they're tank, they're tank and tank and tank. But Welch decided that in order to not fall apart, we have to study revolutions. And he, as a historian, understood, the CEO of General Electric understood history, that any idiot can start a revolution. But to succeed in the long term, you have to control the police, the media, the schools. Who are the police at your church? You know who they are, don't you? How do you get them in on this first incubating experiment? Maybe you grab their mother out of the nursing home. And she has a wonderful time with all these people. And if he's mad about what you're doing in the chain, she's, Gerald, leave these people alone. They pick me up every week. They're praying for me. I got a will and I know how to use it, Gerald. You know, you know <laughs> how do you get to police? The media, the middle between the message and the receiver. Who are the media at your church? It's probably not the bulletin. 
It's probably not the announcements at the lectern. It's probably the meeting that takes place on the parking lot after the meeting, right? How do you get to the influencers of the media? Where are the schools in your church if you're going to pull off a revolution? The pulpit is the one cross-generational school in American society in those churches who value having children in worship. Of course it has to come from the pulpit again and again and again. And they have to understand that, yep, we're going to go through, uh, go through some transition, but at the end here we're going to have, there won't be a child in this church without grandmas and grandparents and aunts and uncles. There won't be a single mom or a single dad in this church without multiple redundant mentors and backup. There won't be a 16-year-old in this church without a second opinion and a third opinion and a fourth opinion. Hmm. Police, media, schools. I want you to look on your outline there. Find one thing and circle it that we haven't covered yet. One thing, not the brain one, the one from this morning. One thing. Something that you might find interesting. God bless you. Turn to someone near you and tell them what you circled. Ready, go. Okay, stop. Uh, one month from now, I'm going to be recording. Um, I'm going to be recording six hours of video teaching on all these points. And if you write rich at richlearning.com, I will send you the clip of that one thing you wanted to know. Okay, rich at richlearning.com. I'm also going to be working on. Some of this brain stuff a month from now, we'll be shooting it out in Portland. And in our last couple of minutes, I want you to look at this sheet right here. Do you see the two brain scans there? One with brains that have been sitting for 20 minutes and one with brains that have been moving for 20 minutes? Why are we sitting right now? Stand up, stand up, come on, come on, come on. Get a little jiggy with it, get a little jiggy with it. Loosen your shoulders, loosen your neck, loosen your jaw. So much of our tension ends up in our jaw. If it looks stupid, you're doing it right. Here are the five, uh, okay, we told you the mind is the brain meets the body meets the environment. 
anything you do to create together that gets their brain and their body and then them playing with each other, teaching each other, you're going to get to their whole mind. There are five arts that I would suggest that neurologically are the most powerful things you can do when you create together. Have one group make up a chant or a song about this key scripture for today. Have one group make up motions, and they can go to aslpro.com and really do the scripture in sign language. Have one group just give them art supplies. Have them make something. Have them paint something. Give them a blank canvas. Create quilting or something. Have one group create a skit or a theater about the lesson. You can do all of this, and then they own it. You don't have to buy something from somebody. They can all do it. It's all free. And do you know what? It ends up being fun, and there's a neurology of fun. When you're having fun, you're getting adrenaline. You're getting adrenaline sister chemical, noradrenaline, which opens the capillaries, which gives more uh, brain, uh, blood to the brain. Oh, my good. You're getting all kinds of wonderful things on dopamine when you're having fun. And you're getting the bonding drugs that say, I want to be with these people. These people know me, they love me, and we have fun together. O-P-E-R-A. I'm only going to make you write, write one thing. Overlap, precision, overlap, precision, emotion, repetition, attention. If you want to be a brain-sensitive teacher, you do things that overlap, and music does that. Dance does that. Art does that. Precision. Music measures pitch and volume and timbre. Put your scripture to music. Why wouldn't you want it to be fixed on their mind? Emotion. When you're creating it yourself, you're getting to the emotional center of the brain. And as soon as the emotional center of the brain uh, it gets connected to the learning, it's like, I'm here. I'm really here. Repetition, you've all learned, myelinate the neurons when they're young and when they're old, they will not depart from it. And the end result is attention, which is arguably the biggest problem we have in American education today. You cannot be the show, the show is over. They will not be bored when they're the show. They will only bo be bored if you're trying to be television for a post-television generation. And tonight, if you'd like a glass of wine or a glass of beer, I'll be holding court out there to talk about the rest of our little thing here. Thank you very much.